Joining us in studio is uh, executive as well as founder of Discovery Insure, Timberlihe Baloi. Good to have you with us today in studio. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. It is. I, I always look forward to engaging in conversation with you uh, and uh, getting your views and perspective on the dynamics. But uh, uh, an overview is what we want to understand is uh, some of the pivotal moments in your life which have structured your development, uh, structured your career so far. And what really stands out for me is that you were young, ambitious, black, educated and had an entrepreneurial spirit within a corporate structure uh, where you took advantage of the opportunities and struck a balance between asking for permission uh, and uh, actually going for things uh, with your gut. Thank you. I, I mean, there's one missing link there, perhaps also visionary, True. because one of the key concerns that I have at the moment is that many people would say I'm ambitious, but uh, what are you ambitious to do? Do you have a vision? And what is that vision all about? And what is it solving? What mm -hmm. problem are you tackling? So I think it's an essential element to bring into a conversation when we talk about how do you break through certain things? How do you break through the barriers that uh, invariably are going to be there irrespective of who you are? Now, without a strong vision built on a deep conviction then whatever that you may be visionary about is no different to infatuation. That's my view of the world. Sure. And therefore, it is pretty much essential that your vision has to have a deep-rooted view driven by a deep conviction that leads you into action. What so perhaps that? that's the thing that I thought while the ambition is there, uh, educated, uh, black, whatever, you've got to have that vision. What was the conviction for you that actually led you to uh, see further than just uh, being lost in this vision, but actually implementing it to see positive outcomes? You know, I recently had a conversation and uh, it's answering your question directly, but I'll start by telling the story is that uh, the individual said to me, man, you want to do this? And this thing takes too long to do. And then I, my immediate response was, I'm a very patient person. Now, there is a way of looking at patience. There's also another way of being misinformed about what patience is all about. Patience doesn't mean that I'm only patient when things are positive or, on, or when things are negative. Patience is such that even if it doesn't look like it's doable, I will patiently seek additional ways of making things happen. Mm. So this is where a small variation from a typical perspective of, I want to make it happen, I'm going to be persistent. Yes, we need persistence, there's no doubt about it. But you've got to have that ability to say, patiently, I will seek other avenues to bring something to life. And, and I think for me, that's essential when you talk about how do you then eventually make it happen. There is a, a process of trial and error. Mm. Uh, there is no doubt that uh, your idea may be brilliant, there are many brilliant ideas that never see the light of day. And it's not because the people are not ambitious. It's not that people are not visionary. Mm -hmm. There is that additional ingredient that you need where you need to be patient and seek alternative avenues to bring it to life. What is it that needs to happen within your environment to ensure that the patience is there, but then at the same time, you ensure that you're working to fruitful outcomes. Because let's be honest, Hemba, like you, many people work in corporate mm -hmm, companies. Mm -hmm. They have the entrepreneurial spirit. They've got ideas that they look to share. Uh, but as you say, there's, there's a secret element. There's another element that needs to come into play for them to actually see uh, their vision and the ideas come to fruition. So going back to that point of seeking other avenues to bring your vision into life, one of the key ingredients for me was the value of mentorship. You think about some of our proverbs and some might have heard me talk about this. Uh, sorry to bore you, but the reality is mm. which simply translated, you go to ask those who have been on the pathway if you really want to get somewhere. And so as a matter of reality, when we talk about mentorship, one of the key things that I want to emphasize is that we're not trying to clone anyone. So when you get, let's say, Lori Dipenar as a mentor, mm. you're not trying to be a little Lori Dipenar or a super Lori Dipenar. All you are seeking is to try and fast track your journey 
so that you don't repeat the mistakes that is made. But what then I emphasize to my mentees is that you need to have multiple sources of reference. And multiple sources of reference, I also live by that. I've got about seven mentors in my life. And that is the key ingredient where if things go pear shape you want to be in a position to get multiple views about how to get out of it. And that's where innovation is born. Innovation is not born out of you just being stubbornly seeking one idea. Innovation comes from everywhere. And that's what Google often say. And the reality is that a lot of companies and a lot of individuals take these things for granted. I mean, you look at the people that are on the street at the moment waiting for their taxis, their buses. True. Those people have got sufficiently strong ideas that could be input into solving those problems that they are handling. But if your view of the world is that ideas are only going to come from Harvard Business School, mm. Gibbs, UCT, GSB, or your CEO, then you are on the wrong pathway because ideas come from everywhere. And that is where the element of having multiple sources of input becomes essential. Very true. I, I want to put this into the context of your experience as a young global leader, uh, as part of the World Economic Forum, and the experiences that you've had in exchanging and having discussions with uh, uh, your international peers, whether they be on the African continent or even from further afield. Given the economic context of the average South African, uh, where radical economic transformation is quite key, uh, we want to see enhanced development of black young individuals. How important is it sometimes for us to take away those blinders that just make us look at things from the South African context to being global citizens who think out the box and act out of the box? I mean, I think that's a very powerful question. And in fact, I just want to extend it a little bit further than what you've said. Yes, I might be involved with World Economic Forum with young global leaders, but at our fingertips, today we've got such powerful tools, your iPhone, your Android, you can listen to podcasts and get ideas from every aspect of society, anywhere in the world. And therefore, it's no longer like it was when we were starting out. When we started out getting into an internet cafe, you had to wait for that uh, mm. download page, takes forever. Today, things are much better. So that means there's a rapid rate of opportunity, which we cannot take for granted. We should not be co complacent in the opportunities lie, that lie in our fingertips, which means when it comes to issues such as the question of radical economic transformation, I see very young people. I mean, I was reading about a 14-year-old who's created a product which might eliminate cancer. And because of this technology and access to technology, sure. he's able to read the journals that I never had access to when I was 14 years of age, and these journals are written by oncologists, they're written by professors in different places, but that information is readily available at your fingertips. Let me be more practical. A lot of people probably don't know that when we're starting up Discovery in Show, one of the key things that I spent most of my time doing was reading what's going on in the financial services globally. So it was not just a perspective of a South African view. Uh. It was not a perspective of the UK view. I read extensively. I was looking at what's going on in Brazil. I was looking at what's going on in uh, Norwich. I was looking at what's everywhere you can think of. And the coalescence of ideas coming from all over is what produces these radical ideas. So we talk about radical economic transformation. Within the South African context, we want to move the ownership of the economy to the majority of the population. But I'm saying move that ownership with radical ideas that are innovative, that provide genuine solutions, and those solutions which the society is willing to pay for. Very briefly, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but what are the pivotal lessons and experiences that you've gained that you hope to pass on to uh, younger leaders and innovators coming up in South Africa? I mean, one thing that I'm very clear about is that your truth is not complete. Everyone's truth is not complete. So having an open mind that I want to add truth to the existing truth that I've acquired in a particular field. In fact, I can just say briefly, one of the best teachers that I've followed for many years always said a degree is not complete knowledge. That is why we call it a bachelor's or we call, call it a master's or a doctorate. So you must continuously be adding truth to the existing truth that you might have acquired elsewhere. 
adding truth to your own truth. Temba Baloy, always a pleasure speaking to you. And thank you so much for your time. He is executive as well as founder of Discovery Insure. That is how we wrap up our view of Kaya Biz for today. Again, log on to our website to listen through to the podcast of today's conversations. And we'll join you again next week, Monday, where we talk markets, finance and business with you on Kaya Biz.